bring up the issue of intuition, I'm reminded of the shamanistic tradition in which the, the shaman acquires great powers and sometimes <coughs> superhuman abilities, but he does so, or she does so, through healing themselves of, of illness. It's almost as if they're better off for having been sick, and, and that seems to imply an attitude very different from normal uh, Western approaches to medicine. Well, one of the things that's very clear to me is that if a person comes in to a practitioner, this could be an allopathic uh, physician, could be a, a shaman, could be homeopathic, could be chiropractic. Uh, what the person is really telling you is, I need your help because this illness or this condition is taking control of my life. Mm -hmm. It is running me. I am no longer able to direct my life in the way that I would like. I need your help to, to restore that balance. Now, that crisis, which is what that is, does not have to be a breakdown. It can be a breakthrough. And that's not just a turn of phrase. What you find is that under conditions of extreme illness, this could be life-threatening illness, it could be very minor. A friend of mine who's a physician just had uh, a cat scratch fever for three months. Mm. And it forced him to reevaluate what were the real priorities that he wanted in his life. When you have a limited amount of energy for three hours a day, what is it that you're really going to do? When you know that you have a terminal disease, how are you going to spend that one year, six months, five years? Are you going to spend it withdrawn, depressed, isolated, uh, medication dependent, or are you going to get your life in order? Are you going to communicate and say the things that you don't have the time ordinarily to say? So the point is, is that no matter how dire the prognosis is, and, and ultimately to be terminal would be the worst possible prognosis, there is a way to respond to that which is either healthy or ill. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the misconceptions we had is that optimal health somehow excludes illness. And that is in categorically not the case because that condition of illness can be the time when the person gets stripped away of all the normal artificial values and is forced to address what can I do with this limited amount of time, energy, or resources. And to me, what people come up to out of that kind of a crisis, be it mental or physical, is really quite extraordinary. Uh, and, and many of the breakthroughs have a kinship with what you pointed out accurately with the shamanistic tradition or mystical experience or a profound insight or a transform transformative experience. Uh, and to me, there's no doubt that illness is clearly a time, potentially, of transformation if it's handled properly. Mm -hmm. And when we're dealing with transformation, when we're looking at balancing relationships, exercise, diet, uh, possible use of drugs or surgical interventions, ultimately it seems to me that we're at the center of all of this is consciousness. It's, it's the integrative capacity of, of the person who is going through this process and, and presumably also the consciousness of, of those individuals, medical uh, personnel or other types of health personnel with whom that individual is working. Exactly. If you look at the recent <coughs> research right now, two factors stand out at the core of interventions, be they preventive or be they crisis oriented. And those are the empowerment of the individual. In other words, the person to come to the realization of the power of choice, informed choice, and choice within certain parameters. But that the person can, can literally exercise a choice. There's a story about William James who found himself in a profound depression. Uh, you know, speaking back to the idea of the, the wounded healer. This is William James, William James, who was regarded as the greatest of American psychologists. Very clearly. Yeah. Um, that he was in a very profound depression, and he was able to rouse himself out of the depression by realizing he had a choice between one thought and the next thought. And that note of optimism and building and saying, well, I'm going to choose to have an optimistic thought, and I'm choosing again, and I'm choosing again, is what he attributes as working his way out of this profound depression. That's what I mean by the empowerment of the individual, to know that there is, albeit in some cases infinitesimal, in other cases quite enormous, that there is choice. So the empowerment of the individual to choose. Secondly is another seemingly intangible factor, which is, which is social support or the social network the matrix within the person exists, the contact with other people, mm -hmm. uh, with the environment, uh, with pets, with, with physically the, the rest of the environment. These two factors really have a tremendous amount more to do with the experience of healing than we ever expected. If you isolate individuals, no matter how well you put that person in an intensive care unit, they will not do as well. And there are some very good studies which have demonstrated people recover more fully from surgery in, win in rooms that have windows versus the same surgical procedure in rooms that don't have windows. Mm. Very, very kinds of, of subtle uh, interactions. To me, if, if I were to isolate two elements, these form the core. 
around that core, you have things like a certain exercise prescription or a certain diet or a certain pharmacological or a certain kind of intervention when the person is in crisis. But without that core, you don't get the healing experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is something critical. One, one last example, which I think is really striking, we assume that aging is an inexorable, in biologically governed process genetically. And there's a fascinating overview of, of aging in science, and they called it normal versus successful. And normal simply meant usual or average. Successful meant what I would term healthy aging. And what they pointed out is the basic <coughs> biological markers for how we know a person is aging, things as fundamental as insulin tolerance and carbohydrate metabolism, et cetera, were highly plastic, in other words, highly, highly influenceable, and influenceable predominantly by the person's empowerment, mm -hmm. awareness of choice, and secondly, by the social support system the person kept and sustained throughout their life. Those are very mm -hmm. critical factors. Let's focus in a little more on, on both of those. First of all, with, with regard to William James' insight, it, it seems that that may be one of the crucial insights of the 20th century, really, that we can control our own thoughts. Uh, very clearly. And it's interesting that control in and of itself is an interesting word because in our culture, we tend to think of it as either manipulating the self or manipulating others. And it really isn't that. And when you look at the literature, what you find, there's one person that we interviewed in the course of a study uh, looking at executives and how they maintain their health under enormous pressure, gave the best definition. It was an executive uh, at, uh, at Bank of America. And he said, I feel like I'm the director of a play rather than an actor in it. Mm -hmm. That's how we define control. Now, an actor is moved about. An actor is said, stand here, say these lines, do this, do that. A director orchestrates a kind of superordinate function that orchestrates, being, brings elements together, literally brings the whole play to life. That's what we mean by control. And very often, in this rather paradoxical or zen-like fashion, gaining control is in, the, is in the process of losing control. Mm -hmm. uh, the person has a breakthrough, an insight that is unusual for that person but has great significance for that person. That lets them know they simply have a choice. And that one dimension is, is really critical. And I would equate almost uh, the awareness of choice with the ability to govern and control your life to a very major degree. And I suppose ultimately the choice is, is something like this, that no matter what is happening to an individual at, at any given moment in time, there's always a choice at that moment to, to make it a little better somehow. Or a lot worse. <laughs> uh, do you remember the movie uh, Gandhi? Yes. Uh, when he was shot, he said, bless you, my son. He was dying, and he knew he'd been mortally wounded. Now think of the, of the infinite number of things that he could have done given five seconds of life. Uh, and yet that was his choice. His, he, he couldn't choose, at least at that point, to live or die. Death at that point had been a mortal wound. But he said, bless you, my son, instead of any number of other things uh, that most of us probably would not have responded quite so generously mm -hmm. in that situation. That, to me, is a, a striking example. And you see that day in and day out in less dramatic instances where a person realizes they're in a hospital, they have a diagnosis, or they know they've got a limited amount of time, or there's, there's a disease that's going to cause them a chronic disability, or there's a veteran who's lost his, his, his legs, or a woman that's, that's lost a child. Um, and you see these choices made day in and day out, circumstances that would overwhelm most people. There's something unique to some individuals that say, what is it that I need to learn from this and then go on with my life? That's extraordinary, that kind of courage. You know.